still trying to understand heavenly places, and we are still in Genesis 1, verse 1. Let's go to Genesis 1, 1. Okay. You see how slow Bible study is? Just one concept. One. I've not even done anything. But we are going to wrap it up in a couple of minutes. Are you ready for this? Okay, Genesis 1, 1. Hello? 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 I look here now. Uh -huh. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. Now, the heaven and the earth together is the concept of scriptures. The heaven and the earth in one place. Now, by Moses telling you, pay attention to this, that God created the heavens and the earth, he is telling you that what God created is a temple. Heaven and earth is a temple. Remember that I told you to understand scriptures, you have to go back to their culture, their worldview. Amen? Hey, ah! Do you know I'm seeing you? I can see you all. And I'm suffering to try to help you understand. So that I stop running heavenly race. Help me. And pretend you are paying attention. But, but if you can't, you can go outside. Really? I don't mind. So I'll be looking at the faces of those that want to learn. Help me. I don't have time. It's heavenly places I want to teach. These are things you teach in one month. And I'm not kidding. <laughs> okay. So I told you that to understand these things, you have to understand their culture, their worldview. And so when they say heaven and earth together, they are talking about a temple. And so Moses telling you that God created the heaven and the earth, He's telling you that God is trying to create a cosmic temple. And if you didn't get that, God put his image in his temple. Genesis 1.26. Let us make man in our image after our own likeness. The word their image is the Hebrew word selem, which means idol. One of the things you see in a temple is, and so God made man as his idol or his representative. Now look at this. When you see the idol of a deity, the idol is not the deity. But when you see the idol, you remember the deity. Who understands what's happening here? And so when God put man on earth, man is supposed to be his representative. That wherever man shows up, you will remember God. Now, pay attention to this. In putting the idol in a temple or in a shrine, one of the ceremonies they do is called the opening ceremony. It's not opening prayer. Is where they open the nose of the idol and open the eyes and open the mouth and open the ear. And when they do that, they try to invoke the spirit of the deity upon the idol such that they can say something to the idol and the deity will do something. Who understands what I'm saying? And so God did his own opening ceremony by himself and God breathed into man the breath of life. Who understands what's happening here? So the people that Moses was writing to understood clearly what he was saying. They were saying that man is God's representative. Hello? Now, pay attention to this. The reason why Isaiah and the other prophets will be insulting the other gods and saying that they are idols, they have eyes and they don't see, they have nose, they cannot hear, is because the idol of God can see and can hear. In fact, those idols were the creation of the idol of God. Who understands what I'm saying? The work of man's hands. And so by that, Isaiah and the other prophets were insulting the other gods. Look at your idol. They are made by man's hands. They have eyes and they cannot see. They have ears and they cannot hear. Isaiah and the rest we are in no way saying that those other deities do not exist. Uh, remember I told you you are a generation that doesn't pretend. Some of you here do Yahoo. Amen? Or upcoming Yahoo artists. You don't go to HK. Amen? But look at this. When the devil makes a pact with a man, 
and tells him, lick shit and I'll give you money. Eh? The devil is trying to insult God. See what you call your representative. Licking shit for money. Do you understand it now? So it, this sin, sin, it's not about you. It's about God. And when you say no, I will not walk in sin. You are being that image of God that God can be proud of. Do you understand now? When you come into a place and you put your hand on the sick for them to be healed, you are being what the image of God should be. Are you following? When an image of God walks on the streets half naked, the devil will be taunting God. See, see your representative. Now, the person doesn't stop to be the image of God. The person is just a broken image. And that is why when God talked about clothing, he talked about glory and beauty. Such that an image of God, when you are going out, you dress like you know. That where you come in, people should have the thoughts of God. And so in my good day, image of God, when you are going out, wear perfume. So that you come into a place and they are not thinking of Satan. Or oh, image of God, brush your teeth. So that you don't say God loves you. And the person will be like, no, tell me again. Please! I don't want to know. Amen? Now, so... By telling you heaven and earth, and by talking about God putting his image in his temple, be, you know, on the sixth day, image in the temple, on the seventh day he rested. Is that true? Now, by using the seven days creation story, Moses has also told you that this is a temple. In their culture and in their day, they dedicated temples for seven days. If they want to dedicate a temple or they want to dedicate a priest, they do it for seven days. Are we together? Let's see it in scriptures. Don't take my word for it. Look at 1 Kings 8 verse 65. 1 Kings 8 verse 65. So the idea that Moses is giving you first day, second day, third day, these, these were to communicate that this is a temple. Because on the first day, as it were, if sun and moon were not yet created, how, Moses, how did Moses know day one and day two? Abina, ah, when was the other lights created? Is it on the third day? So how did Moses know day one and day two? This is because that's not what the story is about. Are you following here? Okay, now, first is 65. And at that time, Solomon held a feast and all Israel with him, a great congregation from the entering of Hamath unto the river of Egypt before the Lord our God, seven days and seven days, even 14 days. Why didn't he say they held the feast for 14 days and kept quiet? It's so that you will know seven days and seven days. This is a dedication of a temple. If you read from verse 1, Solomon was dedicating the temple. Hello. In their day and time, temples were dedicated for how many days now? Okay, Second Chronicles 7, verse 8. Second Chronicles 7, verse 8. Are you following here? Second Chronicles 7, verse 8. You want to understand what heaven is. Also, at the same time, Solomon kept the feast seven days, and all of Israel with him, a very great congregation from the entrance of Hamath unto the river Egypt. So, this is also talking about that, um, that dedication. Look at Leviticus 8.35. We are getting to where it's going to get sweet. Leviticus 8.35 Therefore shall you abide at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation day and night seven days and keep the charge of the Lord that you die not for so I am commanded. This is about the dedication of the priests. So when it has to do with the temple, the dedication is how many days now? Excuse me. Alright. 
So by using seven days for the story of creation, Moses has told you what? That what you have in Genesis 1, God is creating a temple. By telling it is heaven and earth, Moses has told you what? That it is a temple. And actually, when we say heaven is the realm of spirit, is that true? And earth is the realm of man. Where does spirits and man meet? In temples now. Happy now. Hey. Please, forgive and forget me. Let's say this again, okay? Whether you understand or not, just say yes. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. Now, as if you've not gotten it, that this is a temple. Remember, it is about a sunesis that comes from a reading and rereading. Abi. Genesis 2 from verse 1. Let's look at this. Genesis 2 from verse 1. So finally we finish Genesis 1. Are you not seeing? We are making progress. So we are getting to Ephesians. Genesis 2 verse 1. Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished. Pay attention to this. And all the hosts of them. Now I told you, if you see any detail in Moses' story, you will see it again. Take note of it. Hello? Thus, the heavens and the earth were finished and all the hosts of them. Look at the next verse. And on the seventh day, God ended his work which he had made. And he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had made. Verse 3. And God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. Pay attention to that. Now let's look at Exodus 40. If you didn't get that, Exodus 40, verse 33. Exodus 40, 33. Look at this. And he reared up the court round about the tabernacle and the altar and set up the hanging of the court gate. So Moses did what? Finished the work. Did you see God finished his work? Come on. Did you see God finished his work? Did you say no? How about Genesis 2, verse 1. When I'm saying look, you will not look. And I will stop and told you any detail you see, Moses, you will see it again. Look! Bible study is not a joke. Don't think somebody just come out here and say, Today is your day. It is your season. It is okay. Since last 35 years, they've been telling you that. Have your season come? Better look. So Moses did what? Look at the next verse. Then a cloud covered the tent of congregation and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. When God finished his work, he rested. That's the glory of God filling the earth. Hello? They are the same thing. If Moses is building a tabernacle in Genesis when God was creating a temple, the heavens and the earth, a temple, Moses, a tabernacle. And remember that God was constantly saying to Moses, make sure you build according to the pattern shown to you on the map. God has already done this. But he wants to illustrate it to Moses because there is something he's teaching Moses. Hello? Look at the next verse. And Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode there on and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So when God rested on the seventh day, it is that his glory filled the earth. But here's the thing. I told you that Genesis 1 is not about creation. Genesis 1 is God's plan. If you read Genesis 1, you always see the morning and the evening, first day. I mean the evening and the morning, first day. Evening and morning, second day. But on the seventh day, there was no evening and morning. Because God didn't rest. God planned to rest. But he didn't. Look at John 5.17. Look at John 5.17. 
John 5, 17. Come on, come on. Look at this. But Jesus answered them, My father walketh hitherto, and I walk. The Sabbath was supposed to be a teaching. It was supposed to be an illustration. But the Jews, the Pharisees, took it out of context. And Jesus told them, No, my father is still walking till now. He has not rested. And that is why me, I am walking. Who understands what is happening here? Now, look at John 19, verse 30. John 19, verse 30. Pay attention to this. John 19, verse 30. Look at this. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, where is this? Is it on the cross? And he said what? It is finished. Does this look like Jesus trying to build the temple of God? Hold up. Because from his death and resurrection, you are now called the temple of the Holy Ghost. You see, you can't know these things for sure until you go back and study them bit by bit. So God finished and rested. Look at this. Moses finished, the glory of God rested. When Jesus finished, the Spirit of God rested in you. Are you here? If you don't understand it, look at John chapter 2 to see that what Jesus was actually building was a temple. John chapter 2, verse 19. John 2, 19. All these things you are seeing these guys do in the New Testament is sunesis. They've read and read and read. And so when they give you a conclusion, they've read. Jesus answered and said unto them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. You've not still gotten it. Look at the next verse. Then said the Jews, 40 and 6 years was this temple in building. And without rearing it up in 3 days, they still did not understand. And this is why Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 and 7, that this is not the wisdom of the world, because the princes of this world do not know it. Had they known it, they would not have crucified the king of glory, the prince of glory. Are you following now? Look at the next verse. But he spake of what? He spake of what? And so when he was hung on the cross, he said, it is finished. And gave up the ghost. Look at the next verse. When therefore he was risen from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this unto them. I see, even them did not understand it. Until he was risen from the dead. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews 1, 3. Are you seeing something? Are you seeing something? Hebrews 1, 3. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and of holding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Sitting is a rest position. In the ancient temple, priests do not guess it. But Jesus, when he purged our sins, he sat. Because on the cross, he purged your sins and he said it is finished and he rested. The same writer of Hebrews now tells you in Hebrews chapter 4 that the rest in Genesis was not the rest. There is a rest God is talking about. And so if you are born again, God is at rest in you. But God is also at work in you to get other persons that God will also be at rest in. Who understands? And until the whole world receives Jesus as their Lord, God has not fully rested. And that is why in the middle of the night, he will wake you up to pray. God is at work. He is at work. For it is he that worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. God is at work. But he is at rest. But he is at work. But he is at rest. But he is at work. It's the paradox of it. And so the moment the Spirit of God begins to call you to obey Him and you are disobeying Him, God will start struggling with you. But the person that obeys God, God is at rest and God is working through him to also get a resting place because man is a temple. At least you know that one. 1 Corinthians 3.16 
says you are the temple of the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of God dwells in you. Are you following me? So heaven and earth is God's temple. Heaven and earth is God's dwelling place. Let's look at some of these conversations. First Kings 8 verse 14. We are going to read to verse 27. First Kings 8 14. I want you to see this. And the king turned his face about and blessed all the congregation of Israel and all the congregation of Israel stood. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, which spake with his mouth unto David my father, pay attention to this, and hath with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build an house, that my name might be therein, but I chose David to be over my people Israel. And it was in the heart of David my father to build an house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. Now, the house David wants to build for God will be what now? A temple, thank you. It's not an IQ question. And the Lord said unto David my father, Whereas it was in thine heart to build an house unto my name, thou didst well that it was in thine heart. Next verse. Nevertheless, thou shalt not build the house, but thy son that shall come forth out of thy loins, he shall build the house unto my name. So God said to David, your son that will come from you will build a house. Now pay attention to this. Next verse. And the Lord had performed his word that he spake, and I am risen in the room, in the Risen up in the room of David my father and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised and have built a house for the name of the Lord God of Israel. So Solomon thinks he's the one. I mean, you see, these are some of the little, little misunderstandings, but they were doing it in sincerity and God permitted it. Are you following here? Look at the next verse. But even him understood, watch. And I have set there a place for the earth. Wherein is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Next verse. And Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord. Watch this. In the presence of all the congregation of Israel and spread forth his hands towards heaven. Next verse. And he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God like thee in heaven above or on the earth beneath. Who keepest covenant and mercy with thy servants that walk before thee with all their heart. Next verse. Who has kept with thy servant David my father that thou promised him Thou speakest also with thy mouth, and thou hast fulfilled it, and hast fulfilled it with thine hand, as it is this day. Therefore now, Lord God of Israel, keep with thy servant David my father, that thou promised him, saying, There shall not fail thee a man in my sight to sit on the throne of Israel, so that thy children take it to their way, that they walk before me as thou hast walked before me. Next verse. And now, O God of Israel, let thy word, I pray thee, be verified which thou speakest unto thy servant David, my father. Watch. But will God indeed dwell on us? So, even if he's thinking he's going to build a house for God, he's also asking, but, are you seeing what is happening here? Behold, the heaven and heavens of heavens cannot contain thee. How much less this house that I've built them? You know, there's an arrogance people in the New Testament have that they are better than those in the Old Testament. If really there was anybody better, it's them. The guy knew. Look at 2 Samuel 7. We start from verse 1. I used to see the conversation. That's what I want you to follow. 2 Samuel 7 verse 1. And it came to pass when the king sat in his house, and the Lord had given him rest round about from all his enemies. Next verse. That the king said unto Nathan the prophet, See now I dwell in an house of cedar, but the ark of God dwelleth within curtains. Next verse. And Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in thine heart, for the Lord is with thee. And it came to pass that night that the word of the Lord came unto Nathan, saying, Next verse. Go tell my servant David, Thus saith the Lord, Shall thou build me an house for me to dwell in? Really, David? But, but, for even thinking about it, look at the next verse. The last I have not dwelt in any house since the time that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have walked in the tent and in tabernacles. Next verse. In all the places wherein I have walked with all the children of Israel, spake I a word with any of the tribes of Israel whom I commanded to feed my people Israel, saying, Why build ye not me an house of cedar? Next verse. Now, therefore, so shalt thou say unto my servant David, 
Thus said the Lord of hosts, look at this. I took thee from the sheep called from following the sheep to be ruler over my people over Israel. Next verse. And I was with thee, with us whoever thou wentest, and have cut off all thine enemies out of thy sight, and have made thee a great name like unto the name of the great men that are in the earth. Next verse. Moreover, I will appoint a place for my people in Israel, and I will plant them that they may dwell in a place of their own and move no more. Neither shall the children of, children of wickedness afflict them any more as before time. And as since the time that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel, and I have caused thee to rest from all thine enemies, also the Lord tell thee that he will make thee an house. So David, you, you will not build, I will build thee a house. I will, I will make thee an house. Will, hold on. David, I will make thee, I will make you, I will make you my house. Next verse. And when thy days be revealed, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee. Now, pay attention to this. Can you remember the seed of the woman? Genesis 3.16. Can you remember the seed of Abraham? And now you have the seed of David. In Matthew, let's look at Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. So that you understand this guy's already wrote. Don't forget, we are in verse 12. Matthew 1.1. 1, 1. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's telling you that this is a continuation of the Old Testament story. Are you following here? Okay, now go back to verse 12 where we are. Second Samuel 7, 12. Okay, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy boils, and I will establish his kingdom. Watch. Next verse. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom for how long? By saying forever. Does that rule out Solomon? Is Solomon's kingdom forever? Whose kingdom is forever? So the son that God was talking about, is it Solomon or Jesus? So is it by Solomon putting blocks to mold block, or by Jesus saying he's finished on the cross that the temple was built? understands what is going on here now if jesus is god in the flesh and in genesis 1 1 we saw god trying to create the heavens and the earth and then we also see jesus coming in the flesh to die the death that man will become his dwelling place is the story connecting or not they are all connecting okay so we know that it's Jesus that will build the temple. Now I know that when we look at um, Haggai, you know, Haggai said, the glory of the later house shall be more than the former. Uh, the, the later house, the word there later in, in Hebrew means last. So Solomon has built a temple. They just rebuilt a temple. And he's telling them the glory of the last temple will be more than the former. And who is that last temple? It's you and me. In Zechariah, God said to Zechariah, the branch will build me a house. The seed of David, who is the branch, will build me a house. And he was trying to help them understand that this building is not made with hands. It's not by power or by might. It's by the Spirit. You read the whole book of Zechariah. Are you here? Come on, are you here? Now look at Isaiah 66 verse 1. Just trying to see how we can tie this up. Isaiah 66 verse 1. Thus said the Lord, the heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house that you build unto me and where is the place of my rest? Rest. Genesis 2. Rest. Heaven, throne, earth, foot, two, heaven and earth, in the same place. Place of my rest. So you see, it's all tied together in this question. And so what God was trying to build was a cosmic temple. Look at Isaiah 2, verse 2. Ish.
Isaiah 2 2. And it came to pass in the it shall come to pass in the last day that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountains and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Remember where we read that God will inherit the nations. I told you that is the essence of scriptures. And you see again this prophecy that all the nations will flow to the house of God. You see, if, if what God wanted is for us to go to heaven, the Great Commission would have been make sure we make it on the last day. But the Great Commission is go and tell all nations. Is that not true? Is that not true? Go and tell all nations. That's the Great Commission. That's, we, are not, we are not going anywhere. Okay. I'm going to jump a couple of things here. Because, holy brethren, if we continue, we may never arrive. So now, heaven will be the spirit realm and earth will be the physical realm. Let's try to start applying it in the stories. There is much more scriptures to investigate, but let's try to start applying, okay? God gives you a quick understanding. We have no much time. Look at Genesis 11. Genesis 11. We start from verse 3. Are you ready for this? And they said one to another, go to let us make brick and burn them truly or thoroughly. Yeah, thoroughly. Truly, not thoroughly. Truly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. Next verse. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower. A city and a tower. Whose stop may reach the heavens. Now, understand that I told you that the word heaven, as used in the Old Testament, is a metaphor for what? Is a metaphor for what? Okay. It's a metaphor for the spirit realm. And so they were not just trying to build a skyscraper. There is a rebellion that is ongoing because if you look at the judgment of God, it was so vehement. Like I said, we are trying to start applying. I wish I showed you, you know, the idea of mountain, the idea of Eden and all of that. There was something these guys were doing here that was actually really very rebellious. Look at the next verse. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men builded. Next verse. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language, and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Next verse. Go to let us go down there and confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of the the name of it called Babel. Take note of that. Babel. Because the Lord did there confound their language of all the earth. And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. Now, these people were not just trying to build a skyscraper. In fact, they were trying to go into idolatry. Heavy idolatry. They wanted to build a tower that the top will reach the heavens. That simply means a temple. They were trying to build a temple. Or what you can call a zugarat. Can you just put an image of the zugarat? And I'm going to say something in a person. I'm going to say something. No, no, no. Go, 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 go. These are the things we passed, but it's fine. Just pass. Go. Yeah, Zugara. Yeah. Awesome. So, this is what they were trying to build, what we call a Zugara. And if you look at this Zugara, it has the shape of a mountain. Now, in, the, in their time, of course they believe that the sky or heaven is the realm of spirits. And so, if a man wants to go and meet God, he has to climb a mountain. You see that they had meetings with God a lot on mountains. Is that true? And so we read in Isaiah 2 verse 2, the mountain of the lost house. 
You see, David said, I will look up to the hills from where cometh my help. You see, David said, uh, The earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and those that dwell there. For he has found it upon the flood and established it upon the waters. Who shall ascend into the hill of the Lord? Ascend unto the hill of the Lord. So they understood that if a man wants to meet with God, that the place that will take him closer to heaven is a mountain. And climbing a mountain is not an easy exercise. Climbing a mountain is not climbing a staircase. So you have to be serious to climb a mountain. And that is where you get your metaphor of I am on a mountain when you are fasting. Because it's not supposed to be easy. I don't know how you can be on a mountain and take Netflix with you. Amen? Anyway. So here's the thing. It's a temple. It's a meeting place. Now, the top here is what they actually call Babel. And though Babel or Babylon in Hebrew means confusion, in a more ancient language, which is the language that those before Moses spoke, the Akkadian language. Akkadian language. Bab means gate. El means God. Can you remember God? Right? Bab El, gate of the gods. So what they were trying to do, pay attention to this. What they were trying to do in Genesis 11 was to open a portal for the free flow of demons. That is why God came quickly and judged them and stopped it and scattered their language. Hello? Hello? So the scattering of their language, is it cause deliverance? Come on. The scattering of their language, is it cause deliverance? The scattering of their language, is it salvation? Be looking at me. I don't know it's salvation. People want to open portals for demons. And God came and stopped it. It's not salvation to you. I'm not asking you a IQ question. Okay. Don't think. I'll be begging you. Come with your brain. Some of you that went outside, you left your brain outside, I came back inside. Better go and take your brain and come back. Okay. Amen? Amen, no? So when God wanted to scatter these works of darkness, he did it by scattering their language. On the day of Pentecost, when God wanted to build his own temple, he did it by unifying us in a language of the Spirit. Such that when a man begins to speak in tongues, the Bible says he builds himself up. You are that temple. He edifies himself. So what you are doing is that you are rising as an edifice. The Bible says in Jude one twenty, build up yourself in your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost. You are rising as an edifice until you open the gates of heaven. And now you can interact with God in visions, in revelation, in utterance, in power. Do you understand what's going on here? So when you are talking in tongues, you are not doing any mere canal thing. You are building. If God's deliverance came by the scattering of language, the building of his temple comes by the language of the Spirit. And so the man in Christ, it is true that it looks like you're not doing anything, but in the middle of the night, you wake up and begin to go ratos kobre kapai, libro baraga bradidaba. What you are doing is that you are building a temple and you are trying to open the gate for the activities of the spirit. You want people to be saved, open the gate. You want healings to happen. And so if you're a believer here and you take praying in tongues for fancy, how much of a joke are you? Amen? Now, even as God countered this narrative, God also gave his own counter narrative. Look at Genesis 28. We'll start from verse 10. Genesis 28 from verse 10. Pay attention to this. God's idea is not to He's not to take you into heaven. His idea is to reclaim the nations. Are you ready for this? And Jacob went from Beersheba and went towards Haran. And he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took up the stones of that place and put them for his pillow and lay down in the place to sleep. And he dreamed. And behold, a ladder set up on the earth 
and the top of it reached to heaven. Did you see this in Genesis 11? Hey, when I say look, you close your eyes. When I now say close your eyes, you look. The top of it reached to heaven. Did you see that detail in Genesis 11? Ah, let's go back. Genesis 11 verse 4. And they said, go to let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And we said, it is idolatry. But God's counter narrative, go back to Genesis 28, the verse we are reading. Genesis 28, the verse we are reading. Next. Next. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God are ascending and descending on it. See, when you speak in tongues, in the natural, somebody may look at you and say, ah, what is this one doing? But what you are doing is that you are building a temple and a runway where angels can ascend and descend. And if I were you, I would do it a lot. I would do it a lot. You want to see the power of God in manifestation? Speak in tongues a lot. Look at what happened in Genesis 11. To scatter that, God scattered their language. But to build his own temple on the earth, on the day of Pentecost, he unified their language in the spirit. And the world gathered. Hallelujah. No, don't say praise God. Next verse. And behold, the Lord stood above it. So instead of the deities they wanted to stand above it in Genesis 11, God himself is now the one above this one. When you speak in tongues, you are creating a heaven and earth. God made the heavens and the earth by speaking. You too, when you speak and prophesy, you are building God's heaven and earth. Are you paying attention to this? So, if you really want to see the move of God on the earth, because the earth has been given to the sons of men. We read it. Psalms 115 verse 16. If you want to see the move of God on the earth, you must be given to tongues. Long hours of tongues. I will not lie to you. I will not deceive you. If you like, carry all the seed and give every man of God you see in Oere and let all of them lay their body on you. It's not even lay hands. They take themselves and lay it on you. Nothing will happen. Even if something happened, it will be for a while. You will just be like the handkerchief and apron of Paul. You know, when those handkerchiefs contacted Paul, they carried something. But it was not forever. So even if a man of God lays hands on you, you carry something, but it's not forever. It's just... But you want to get the one that endures. Eh? You must be given to tongues. And now that these things are boring, social media, all these things, eh? I told you that we are in a generation that if it's not prayer challenge, they will not pray. If it's not hallelujah challenge, they will not shout hallelujah. See, I've been saying hallelujah. But if I say hallelujah challenge, uh, open your mouth. We're in a generation, it looks like people are running mad. And that's the devil's deception because he knows it is in these boring things that real prophets are made. Boring things like Bible study. It's not, it's, it's not jingoism. You are in the secret place, hidden from the eyes of men. And you are studying to know the Lord and to know your God. And you are also giving to tongues. It is in these things that real prophets are made. Are you here? Look at the next verse, please. And thy seed shall be on as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. When God tells you this thing, he's saying you will cover the earth. That's God's plan. It has always been to cover the earth with the gospel. And in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Next verse. And behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whithersoever thou goest. Does this sound like when Jesus said to his disciples, Lord, I'm with you to the end of the age? Because it is one plan. All those your heavenly race. They are joking. They have not finished the work on earth. You want to escape to heaven. 
So you are just waiting for that great day. You will wait. And I will bring thee again to this land, for I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. Now look at the next verse. There is something I want to show you. And Jacob went out of his sleep and he said, Surely the Lord is in this place and I knew it not. Look at the next verse. And he was afraid and said, How dreadful is this place? This is none other but the gate of God, the, gate, the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. Do you remember Babel? Do you remember Babel? Yes. Now, Jacob is also saying this is the gate of heaven. It's a counter-narrative. And I wish you are, you are not off the switch of your brain. I wish you got it. The details are there in the stories. Hello? And as if that is not clear enough, Jesus now broke the table. John 1 50. John chapter 1 and verse 50. So if, if you are struggling to get it, Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believers thou. Thou shalt see greater things than these. Look at the next verse. And he said unto him, Verily, verily, I said unto you, Hereafter, you shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. And so Jesus becomes that temple. Jesus becomes that ladder. And look at this. The man in Christ has the ability to be on earth and to switch and be in heaven. Remember we said that heaven is the spirit realm. We are trying to apply. There are many details I left out. Heaven is the realm of the spirit. So the man in Christ can be here in the physical, in the natural, but can switch and be in the spirit. And he can know what is happening in his village by the spirit. Because the man in Christ has become God's heaven and earth. Are you paying attention to this? The man in Christ has become God's heaven and earth. And you switch into that faster when you are giving to tongues. Again, the judgment to prevent the building of Babel, the gate of the gods, was to scatter their language. In God's unification of building his own temple is to unify our languages in one, in the spirit. Are you following here? So, when you now look at all the narratives of Paul, you will see when he talks about edification, the word edification, oikoidomio, or epioikoidomio, which talks about a building up or a building, he is illustrating to you that you, the man in Christ, you are a temple. And when you speak in tongues, you edify yourself. When you prophesy, you edify the saints. We build the house of God by speaking. Because God built his temple by speaking. And so we get to the conclusion that heaven is the realm of the spirit. Heaven is not a place that you will fly to to retire. Hello? If we have some more time, we are going to look at Matthew's usage. But let's go to Luke 9. Luke 9, verse 54. We are trying to wrap this up. There was a time I gave as a promise to Pastor Daniel that we will finish. Look at Luke 9, verse 54. Look at this. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, people that were chasing Jesus out of their village, when they saw this, they said, Lord, will thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them even as Elias did? That's what the disciples of Jesus said. Look at the next verse. And he turned and did what? He turned and did what? Now, by rebuking them, he's telling them that's not what the fire of heaven is for. Elijah did not command fire from heaven to devour people. He commanded fire from heaven to devour sacrifice and to show that Yahweh is God. Are you here? So he rebuked them and said, 
You know not what manner of spirit ye are of. He didn't say fire will not come down from heaven. He didn't say you don't know what fire is. He said you don't know the manner of spirit you are. Because heaven is a realm of spirit. And heaven is not exclusive to God. So to call down fire to consume people will be to walk with the devil, not with God. That's why he said you don't know the manner of spirit. Because heaven is a realm of spirit. Uh, are you confused? You cannot be confused now. All these things we have been doing since, but you can't be confused. So he said, you know not what manner of spirit you have. That means that person that prays, die by fire in Jesus' name. Just walked with the devil. I'm not even saying it with apology. Because when they said, let us call down fire to consume people, Jesus rebuked them and said, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. Now look at the next verse. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives. So if you are calling down fire from heaven, that is not to set people on fire. The fire that doesn't consume. If it is the fire that kills, you are walking with the devil. I mean, these things are all there. But Paul said, when you read. Problem is that people don't like to read. See, I've not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. Are you following? Look at Ephesians 1, 3. Ephesians 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. So, heavenly places in Christ will be what? Will be what? Temperature. Heavenly places in Christ will be what? The spirit realm. So the blessings you have, he has told you they are spiritual blessings. And they are in the spirit. So that person that is saying that the blessings are in the heavenly places, but where you need them is in the earthly places. Let us pray so that we can bring the blessings from the heavenly places to the earthly places. Is a daft Bible illiterate. Because Paul has told you it is a spiritual blessing. And he goes ahead. You see, you see that thing in front of Christ? That is called a colon. Normally in English language, for people that understand English, in English language, when you see a colon, it means I'm going to explain further what I've just said. Heavenly, spiritual blessings and heavenly blessings in Christ. So if you didn't get it, look at the next verse. According as he has chosen us in him, the blessing is he chose you. You are his choice. So he said, I have committed 35 abortions and you are possessed of this thing. How can they deliver you and you are preaching the word of God? He chose me. I'm his choice. That's the blessing. I'm his choice. And he said that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Nobody can accuse me before God. That's a spiritual blessing. Do you understand? As if you didn't get it, look at the next verse. Having predestinated us unto adoption. You remember adoption? Look at the next verse. As if you didn't get it. Look at the next one. In whom we have redemption through this blood, the forgiveness of sins. Is this a spiritual blessing? Are you seeing that all the things Paul is talking about here are spiritual blessings? In the spirit. So heavenly blessings will be what? In the spirit. It's not a place you retire to. After being a good Christian. It's a reality with you here and now. Hello? And that is why he went on to pray that they will understand these things. What we call the Pauline prayer. That they will understand it. Are you here? Look at Ephesians 19. 119, sorry. Ephesians 1.19. He said, And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who do believe according to the working of his mighty power? Go, go, go. Next verse. Which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. Set him at his own right hand. Now, I want you to understand 
that Jesus is not sitting down somewhere. You know, God the Father is in the middle. God the Son is at his right hand. And God the Holy Ghost, I don't even know. Maybe he's flying on top because he's a bird. He's a balakuku. You know, you know, when people are Bible illiterates, a lot goes on. John said to you, the Holy Ghost descended on him like a dove. If I say, sir, what's your name? Emeka. If I say, Emeka entered here like a snake, and I say, draw Emeka, and you draw a snake. Are you not an idiot? When I say, the Holy Ghost descended like a dove, and now you want to draw Holy Ghost, you draw. She is funny. But uh, was it not your logo one time? Spirit. Mm. I say, ah, that this guy is just charging like a bull. And I say, draw him. You now draw a bull. All through scriptures, they've told you the spirit of God is roak, unseen. And I want to represent the Holy Spirit, you draw bed. These are the things Jesus will look at and say, Ella, Ella. Kabashi. Now look at this. To be at the right hand of God doesn't mean that Jesus is seated somewhere. The right hand of God is a figure of speech. Is an ancient governmental figure of speech. How many of you saw Game of Thrones? Don't worry, if you didn't see it, it's fine. I don't even know which Nigerian movie to hear. That actually I told you if you, you cannot see that kind of sheep. You, okay, all right. Let me let me, let's not go there. Now, if you saw Game of Thrones, there is an office, there is an administrator called the hand of the king. So the, the king exists, but then there is that office called the hand of the king. The hand of the king is the one that controls everything. The king just stays there to have fun. But the hand of the king does the administrative function, as it were. And so for Jesus to be at the right hand of God, that's an office. It's not a place. It's not a location. Thank you so much. It's not a location. So, that means that Jesus has been set in that office where he is the administrator of God's power. Remember when Jesus rose from the dead, he said all authority in heaven and earth. That's what it means to be at the right hand of God. Are you paying attention to this? And then that posture or that, that position, that office is in the spirit. Hello? It's where? It is where? As if that is not enough. Go to chapter 2, verse 6. I just want to give us applications of this. Look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. And he raised up us together and made us sit together. Now, hold on. Right hand of the Father is where Jesus is. In the Spirit. Is that true? Right hand in the Spirit. And now, he said, he raised us together and made us sit together. We are not sitting like putting our boot off somewhere. Amen? We are gaining application. We are not sitting somewhere. To sit is also a governmental language. For example, you go to the governor's office to see him and they say he's not on seat. It doesn't mean he's not sitting down somewhere. It means he's not available to perform his governmental duties. So to be seated with Christ means that you are at that right hand of God with Christ. It means you are also a custodian of the power of God. Now, if believers are not taught this, they will keep being irresponsible. Or don't you know it is your duty to say that will be done on earth as it is in heaven? What does that mean? Your will be done here as it is in the spirit. There is a plan God has. 
Some of you will sleep and dream dreams where you are preaching in a stadium and people are singing and glorifying God. But in the natural, you look around you. Nobody is doing that. Don't you know as a son of God, you are supposed to go to work? Don't you know you are supposed to be giving to fasting and prayer? To build God's heaven and earth. That temple, such that when you speak to people, your words come with an atmosphere. And eventually what you saw in the spirit will happen in the natural. That men all around you will lift up their voices and glorify God. But you see, because we don't know what these things are. So to make you to sit together, so that seat where Jesus is sitting in the spirit, in the spirit, you are also in that seat. Now, it is not a seat. Remember the illustration I gave you? It's an office. So if Jesus was on earth and he saw a person possessed by demons, he would cast him out. Abi, now because you are seated in the same office, it means you have the authority. You have the right to say to a demon, get out. If the demon says, ah, you that, you that I saw what you did in the secret, you say, shut up, get out. You see, the governor doesn't need to be liked for him to perform his governmental duties. Demons don't need to say, ah, he's a good person. Okay, let us go out. No. If, if they don't, you get out. You see, the devil didn't want me to tell you this one. It's a governmental authority. It's a governmental right. It's an office to execute. And now, as I close, because there is much more to say to you. Please, where is the keyboard? Please come and play. This is where people should start crying. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Now, the judgment day, the judgment day, is not about assigning who will go to heaven or not. The judgment day is the day you will give account of what you did in that office. That authority Jesus has given to you, what did you do with it? That's what the judgment day is about. If Nigeria was the same country, if Nigeria is a country of people that are saved, as a person is coming out from office, EFCC will probe them. All these organizations and agencies will probe them. That's, that's, that's judgment. So they will be asked, for the four years you were here, what did you do? The judgment day is not about assigning who will go to heaven or not. You are already seated with Christ in the heavenlies. That is in the spirit realm. The judgment day is going to be questions like on the 19th of April 2024 after you heard the word and you tasted the truth I began to nudge you to read your Bible but you pushed me aside and now people around you died in ignorance what will you answer for yourself that's what the judgment day is about the judgment day is about the fact that God will tell you in the midnight on the 20th of April, 19, no, 2024, Pastor James told you that to build my temple on the earth is by speaking in tongues. And I woke you up in the middle of the night to speak in tongues and build my work upon the earth. But you looked at me when I woke you up and you slept back. What are you doing with your authority? That is what it is about. That is what it's about. You are God's heaven and earth. You are that being. You are the being that God created that is able to execute on the earth and still go to heavens and still execute. In the place of prayer, in the place of fasting, you can go on earth. Why? Because the way God created it, heavens follow the earth, not the earth following the heavens. For he said to Peter, whatsoever you bind on earth is bound in heaven. And whatsoever you lose on earth is loosed in heaven. And so you, the Son of Man, God has given you authority upon the earth. And He says, Whatsoever you bind in this city of Ogere, where people are profane, it is because they are ignorant. 
But as you now come into the revelation of Jesus and you understand that you can't open the gates of heaven unless you begin to speak the language of the Spirit, then therefore you will give yourself to tongues. You will give yourself to tongues and intercession. You will give yourself to Bible study. Why? God's plan is to recover the nations. And as long as I'm in, I'm in, I'm in into, as long as I'm in a way, I will cover as much as I can and I will encourage my brother to encourage to get as much as they can and encourage my sister to get as much as they can. And we all together, for one shall chase a thousand, but two will put a nation to flight. If everybody here, if everybody here, we will take that decision because that is what heaven is about if you are here and you are not baptized with the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking with tongues I want you to just come towards me because in the unification of the language it was given by the language of the spirit the Bible says they all spoke with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. If you are not baptized in the Holy Ghost, please come towards me. Let's get you filled. Let's get you filled. Okay. That means every other person here is filled in the Holy Ghost. Let's pray in the Holy Ghost, everyone. Pray. Pray in the Spirit. Pray in the Spirit. God has made you a priest. You are not baptized in the Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. I want to once again thank my host, Pastor Daniel, and his beautiful team. I like the order. I like the synergy. I pray for every one of you that my God will help you. Amen. My God will bless you. Amen. The hand of God is upon your life to do you good. Amen. You put on favor and the message of God speaks for you. Amen. I pray for everyone here. Every blessing and every grace released in this meeting you have an abundance of it. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Your minds are open. Your spirit is sensitive. As you sit before the Lord to study the word from today onwards, scriptures open to you. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. the supernatural opens to you. Amen. In the name of Jesus, Amen. the reality of the heavenly place is open to you. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Amen. Now I took permission from Pastor Daniel. You can put that community group again. I told him that we are starting a Bible reading community. I found out a lot of people do not know how to read their Bibles right. And we are starting a community to help people read their Bibles properly. And so if you want to join the community, please scan the QR code and join the community. And then finally, okay, second to last, the truth you know now has put a responsibility on you to go and learn the truth and to tell another person. These things we've taught, listen to it again and again. Read your notes. Read the Bible. And go and teach someone else. Hallelujah. From time to time, check any, any, any um, platform, YouTube. Just search Official James Maker. You will see my teachings. Everything I'm doing here, I took permission from Pastor Danny. Search for it, and you will find these seminars. Hallelujah. And more so, I'm going from campus to campus because I've understood that the Gen Zs, it's not that they hate God. It's just that they don't like to pretend. So if they are told the truth, they will serve God well. So I'm going from campus to campus to preach and to teach in these Bible seminars. And to do that will require hotel accommodations for me and my team, feeding, 
hiring projectors, stuff like this. And in places where we don't have good men, like Pastor Daniel, we may need to hire venue and all sorts and all sorts. And so please, if you want to partner with us, please, virtually, I want you to put the account details. If you want to partner with us, please, this is one of the people working with me. So you can just get that account detail and partner with us. God bless you. See you the next time I see you. Please, when Pastor Daniel comes back from his trip, I want you all to give him a hug and a kiss on my behalf. He will not reject it. It is a hug from the Holy Ghost. So hug him and kiss him aggressively and tell him I sent you. God bless you. Thank you, sir.